H2K Infosys provides world-class online IT training, staffing and software testing solutions to customers worldwide. H2K Infosys, how we are different from our competitors. 100% job oriented training, hands-on project work, cloud test lab, resume preparation and review, mock interviews, robust syllabus, one-time fee and lifetime access to classes, access to recorded sessions of live classes. H2K Infosys has won the trust of thousands of students worldwide. For a free demo class, visit us at h2kinfosys.com. So the first step is you need to analyze the requirements. You have to understand the manual test cases that are prepared and uh, also look at the requirements, what you're going to automate. Um, like I think most of you guys have an idea like how these uh, requirements and the test cases are done. Uh, let me quickly show you. Okay. So, if you any project, you will get uh, this kind of uh, the requirements document, and also you're going to prepare uh, the test cases. Right? So, these are the requirements, and also you will get a chance to prepare uh, the manual test cases uh, either in Excel sheet or some tools. Okay, so these are the kind of manual test cases that are done. And your job is you're trying to automate these uh, manual test cases part of your body. So that's where first you need to understand what the functionality is and then what are the requirements for the project. So identify the requirements for the manual test cases to be automated and identify the test data needed to execute the test case and run the manual test case at least once to understand the functionality. Basically, you're going to look at what are the manual test cases then, right? And just go through these steps. And then execute at least once this particular manual test case to make sure what are the data that is mentioned part of this test case. Is it uh, sufficient for you to uh, create the automated scripts? Right, so you're going to execute at least once. So here the step says you're going to open this uh, application and this web application, you open the browser and then input this URL and then see, okay, system displays the home page. And also the next thing is you're going to enter this uh, phone numbers and the passwords and then see if it's successful login. That way not just, uh, you're going to part before you develop any automation script, just you want to make sure so the data I've mentioned in the part of this test case is correct and the data is valid. The reason is because these manual test cases done maybe the long back, whatever data that is mentioned, it may not be valid. So those are the things you're going to look at first by understanding the functionality and try to identify the data that is required for the test case in order to automate. Then once you're done with this uh, step, so okay, you got the right uh, data and you got the right test case on the requirements, everything is good. And the next step is you're going to install the UFT tool on your system. In order to, before you install the UFT tool, but you need to understand the application environment. So that means where the application is developed, what is the technology that is used to develop this application application environment. 
Likewise, really required to understand the application environment. Let's say going to talk to the development guys. Okay, is it a .NET based application or a Java based application <coughs> or something else? That's a your main thing. That way, now when you install EFT itself, you are going to identify the required add-ins because how the how the EFT works is. Uh, say, for example, you are testing uh, an application developer Java. You have to have the Java add-in installed along with UFT. As while installing UFT, part of the wizard is going to display the available add-ins. The default add-ins, what you get is just the web, ActiveX, and Visual Basic. Those are the default add-ins that comes with UFT. But if you are testing an application built on Java, you are going to explicitly install Java add-in along with UFT. Generally, you should be able to create any scripts on the applications built on Java technology. Same is the case, like if you are testing an application built on .NET, you have to have .NET add-in installed along with the uh, UFT tool. Because those are the add-ins that are available along with UFT, but they don't install by default. So you're going to select explicitly, I need this button add-in part of your installation. Okay, so that's what uh, before you start install, either you can talk to the development guys, because those are the best people, they can tell you what this application technology. Okay, so that is the next step. First, you need to understand the application side. You need to understand what is the requirement, what are the manual test cases that you are going to automate. And the second step is you are going to identify what's the application environment and uh, identify the required addings to be installed along with UFT. So once these preliminary steps are done, so you're going to install the UFT. And here, when you install UFT in real time, basically you have two kinds of license mechanisms. So UFT has uh, two license types we use in the products. So node lock license and uh, the floating license. So node lock license is uh, specific to the system wherever it is installed. This specific is a node lock, right? Specific to the that particular node or the system. So once you install this node lock license, wherever it is installed the EFT is available on that particular machine only. If somebody wants to work on EFT, they have to go to the perfect system and then work. Whereas the floating license is the one. Floating license will be installed on the server. So these are basically the server-based license. The floating license gets installed on a server, so you need not worry about this part. Basically, IT guys, um, they are going to put all this license on one of the server machines where everybody can access that particular server. All you have to do is, whenever you are trying to access this floating license, you have to mention the server name. So, for example, if you look at here, um, part of this installation, you will get uh, these additional tools. And then, so you can look at the additional installation requirements, right? Anyway, part of your installation, you will get this window in the last step of your installation. So that time you're going to select what's the license you're going to use in the project. 
see this is the window like you will get at the end of your your team solution, right? So when you check this, uh, say run in solution beta, right? If you click on this run button, then it's going to give you two lesson types. But if you're using evolution copy, obviously you're not going to run this in solution. So just going to click cancel button. But in the real time, obviously you have to install the license because you get a regular version, not the evolution copy. So this is the seat license. This is the node lock, or the second one is the concurrent license. We say floating license. Okay, so node lock or the seat license, floating or concurrent license. So when you select the seat license, and then if you click on next button, then it's going to ask you to put the license number. That's what you get from HP Compare. So they're going to mail you, once you buy that license, right? They're going to mail you the license number. Then if you click on next button, then it asks the license number. They're going to input that license number. So you're done. Well, as you know, I'm going to use this component license. So you're going to select this option and then click next. That time, instead of asking the license number, it's going to ask the server name. Because these concurrent licenses will be installed on the server machine, so you will get that server name where this ERP license is installed from the IT department. So whatever they, they say, you are going to put the server name that you know, so you should be able to connect to that server and then use that license. So what is that uh, difference between these two is, it is specific to that machine where it is installed. Nobody else can use this license. It is specific to that system. That's why even when HP generate this license, they will ask you to provide your system uh, ID. That's why they're going to generate the license specific to that system. But whereas the floating license is a kind of shared license. Say, so for example, you have one license, right? That means one person can use at a time, one at a time. So today, just you have some UFT work, you have to develop some script, then you can use that license. And tomorrow, you don't have any UFT scripting, so all you have to do is you can release that license somewhere so that somebody else can use that license. So that is the floating license behavior. Okay, suppose if you have say 30 licenses, then 20 people can use that license at a time. 20 people. Okay. So most of the time, that's why actually it has its own advantage. It's not specific to the system. Whenever that license is free, somebody else can connect to that license and then he can use UFP on his machine. So that's why it's more flexible. Uh, the companies go for the floating lessons. Okay, so instead of this uh, specific to the node lock license, though the floating license is a little bit more expensive, but still it has its own advantage. That's what. Okay, let's uh, go and maybe it's uh, somewhere like three four thousand dollars more the floating license compared to the seat license. So that's where like uh, you can use this uh, floating license and stuff for the node license. That's what the company said for the real-time projects. Okay. So there are the licensing types. Once you install the EFT tool, so you're going to select here whether you're going to use the seed license. Most of the time, you're going to select the concurrent license. If you click next button, then it's going to ask the server name. What are the server name you get from the IT department, wherever the uh, floating license are installed. You're going to put the server name and then you should be able to work with the FT tool. Okay. So there are the two licensing types that will be used. So once you install this QTP, so you're going to select that install. Uh, so you're going to select the license at the end of this installation. Okay. So installation has uh, two steps. First, you need to identify the required addings. 
Jetpack development team. And the second step is uh, if you don't have information what's the license you are using, say that you can um, talk to. Just give me one sec. Just give me one sec, I'll be back. Okay, um, sorry. All right, so here some people are saying like full screen. Let's say like you can maximize on your WebEx if you want. See on the on the top you see the WebEx toolbar. So there uh, you will get a, a zoom options. You on the view menu you can select full screen. Okay, that is from the user side. All this WebEx. Okay, because on my system I'm showing the full screen my PPT. But from your system, you can select on the top toolbar, the WebEx toolbar. Go to the right side. There is a, a drop-down menu. Go and select View Full Screen. Okay. And uh, Anil, uh, Anil, um, here he is not able to hear. Basically, he couldn't dial into the conference. Okay, so there are the lessons in types like uh, you can you can use, and uh, once you're done with this these two steps, then pretty much like you're good to develop uh, automation scripts. Then what's the next step? Is uh, you're going to create the framework. So this is the final step again. Uh, you are going to create the framework. That means you are going to come up with a, a folder structure. Anyway, we are going to have a very detailed discussion in later part of uh, this uh, course. And then um, you should be able to... You can call into the web and then you say, I'm not here, I'm not here. Oof. Okay, guys. Sorry. Okay, so we're going to create a uh, part of this framework. So we're going to create a folder structure, and you follow certain coding standards because you're going to do a lot of scripting on the project. Right, so you write uh, functions, you write some methods, subroutines, you write some classes. So there are a lot of stuff, a lot of scripting will be done. So you have to follow certain coding standards, like how you do the scripting. 
And also, we are going to identify what's the common functionality in the application. And then you're going to create a reusable components. This is a, a little bit the tedious task. This anyway, like it's not a, a single person task, it's a teamwork. Like the team is going to meet and then identify what are the common functionalities for the application. Something like a, a open application, login, open or browse for the file, close application. So you are going to identify that kind of the common functionality and you write functions. The advantage here is you are trying to avoid the redundancy of the scripting because I don't want to I don't want to create the script login again and again. Instead, I create a function for logging, and then I'm going to use the function in our message. So that's where, when you look at your script, the UFT script, it mostly contains calls to the functions. So you're not going to hard code any scripting. Instead, you write a function and use that function in all your scripts. The advantage here is the maintenance is very easy. You can maintain a function very easily. Whereas if you want to maintain the scripts, that's a difficult part. Okay, so that part anyway, I'm going to, uh, we're going to discuss later, like what that uh, maintenance, how it will be easy, uh, like between the function versus the scripting. But as you create uh, the shared object repositories, and also come up with the data files, since you're going to create your test data in some external file, and then prepare some project constraints and identify the reporting mechanism. So what kind of reports uh, we want. Mostly the manager is interested in HTML reports. So we're going to generate those reports and then send it to the people. So that's all the stuff like what we discussed in the previous slide is part of your framework. So we're going to have detailed discussion on each step here, what we mentioned. What are the framework? This is just to give you a high level. So what is the process involved? So the first step is you, you identify the requirements, you identify the test cases. Second step is you identify the required addings. And also you identify the license. And the third step is you're going to create the framework. And part of that, uh, you're going to create all these steps. You follow these different steps, coding standards, the border sectors, when you create the reusable component, shared repositories, data files, project constraints, and the reporting mechanism. So once you uh, create this framework, then we follow mostly the projects, the hybrid scripting. Since you're going to do the scripting based on shared object repositories and uh, also the descriptive program. So we do both based on the shared object repositories. And also, whenever you have some issues with object repository, then we we'll use this descriptive programming approach to work on those problems. Okay? So that's a hybrid scripting we follow most of the time. And uh, what are the issues like where the descriptive programming is useful? So we have a separate session for that. And also, like we do the script enhancements, parameterization, because you are going to read data from additional Excel files. Uh, so you're going to test more volume of data. And also the verification points. So you create a lot of checkpoints. Uh, and also here, like you know, you're not going to, most of the time, you're not going to hard code any checkpoints. Something like you use different methods like get arrow property and the set to property, set arrow properties. Those are the methods you're going to use uh, to handle any kind of dynamic objects. Okay? And also you can capture any snapshots at one time. You're going to use different methods. Um, and also you create some XML checkpoints, particularly when you trust the web services, that part. And uh, then you're going to capture the runtime data using these output values, regular expressions to handle this dynamic object. The objects change at runtime. 
and we do the transactions. Reasonable actions on the redistribute functions, recording types. Let's say you uh, do different recordings, analog, low level recording, and also uh, object based recording that is an inside recording. That's a new feature, anyway, in UFT inside recording. So it has its own advantages. So I'm going to show you some case studies where you can really use uh, that inside recording. Because we have a, even in the current projects where we are working, we have some difficulty to automate some of these applications. They use uh, mostly this ribbon-based technology. So that's where uh, we are very successful using the inside recording with UFT. Because we have a lot of pains with TTP to recognize the tens of this. Okay, so we'll discuss those case studies, uh, how you're going to do this uh, inside recording and the uh, different other recordings, where it is useful, the analog and the low level recordings. And also custom reporting, because it's not used to handle any runtime exceptions. You're going to use the built in feature, the recovery scenarios in UFP, and also we do the scripting part, like on other resume next. So that, that way, just you can handle any kind of runtime exceptions. So these are the things part of your script announcement. And then uh, we also initially, you're going to debug your script, case language execution, to make sure the script is working good and you're getting the right data into the script. And then, so you're going to schedule uh, the test. So you're going to execute a batch of scripts, like multiple scripts, 100, 200 scripts, I want to run tonight. So either you can use the quality center, that's where you can schedule your test and go home. So that is going to trigger all the tests in the next good. Or you can use within QTP. Suppose if you don't have tools like quality center, within QTP itself, you can create some master script and then execute all your 200, 300 scripts. Or else you can create a master script using VD script, and you're going to use um, the Windows scheduler to schedule those tests. Because in my experience, most of the projects, you have UFT to automate the scripts, but you don't have quality center. That's where you end up with using this VD scripting to create a master script, and then you can schedule with Windows Scheduler. Windows Scheduler, in a way, that comes with Windows operating system. That's a very beautiful feature where you can schedule your tests, like how frequently you want to run your scripts, right? So you can schedule and then run your tests. So do the things like uh, we practice in the real time. So we'll discuss these features. And then the next step is you're going to do the result analysis. Once your 200, 300 scripts get executed, then you do the result analysis, uh, what's the script fail, and how many script pass. If for uh, any script that is failed, so you go and look at it in detail, which step is failed, is it an application issue or the script issue. Obviously, if it is an application issue, you end up with uh, creating a defect and then send that issue to the development team. So if it is, uh, a script issue, obviously, is that it likes the responsibilities with you. So you have to correct those script issues and then re execute your test. And then, most of the time, as I mentioned before, so you're going to prepare this HTML reports and then post it on the internet. That's where everybody uh, in the team can access your test results um, and they can look at and then see what's going on on the application. So these are the steps basically like we follow in order to automate this testing process. Okay, let's uh, quickly summarize. Understand the requirement test cases. Then identify the e-addings and the licensing license type. Create your framework. Then we develop the scripts by following mixed approach, shared works and descriptive programming, DP. Then we do the different enhancements. 
and then we also debug the script to make sure the logic logic is nothing but we are going to put some conditional statements in the script right so it tells conditions do while for loops just to make sure the logic implementation is working good and then also like you have to make sure you're getting the right data into the script then you schedule your test and run them do the result analysis prepare your test reports and then just uh, publish on the internet and send it to the other stakeholders okay so the other steps anybody having any questions uh, let me know just we're going to look at uh, some of these uh, features how many defects generally we get in one script no it all depends it's not specific to the script most it is specific to the application right so what's the complexity of the application initially you will get more defects then as and when the functionality gets very more stable then uh, your defect rate obviously uh, comes down but initially like, you will get a lot of defects but mostly like keep in mind uh, this uh, automation test script execution happens once the functionality is stable right so that's where like you are going to find out mostly the regression part of your script executions Yes, I'm going to send you this PowerPoint presentation as part of the class notes. So I will get this. All right, any other questions? All right, so now let's uh, look at some of these uh, basic uh, the features. Anyway, like, uh, let's start with uh, this year. Okay, so this is what I'd like to get. Uh, once you start uh, the UFT, write the admin manager window. So let's uh, quickly go through these features. What is this admin manager window? What's the importance of adding in UFT? So this is what I'm talking before. You see, if you don't select any add-ins when you install UFT, all you get is ActiveX, Visual Basic, and Web Add-in. Those are the three default add-ins what we get. And these are the add-ins I explicitly installed when I do here. Like I selected Java add-in and also I selected SAP and kernel emulator. Suppose if you are testing an application built on Java, you have to have this Java add-in installed. Then only it shows up in this add-in manager. Otherwise, it doesn't show up. Similarly, if you are testing an SAP GUI part, SAP application, terminal emulators are mainly command line interface. So if you are testing any kind of applications on the command line, something like the main frame applications or uh, your Unix, Unix operating systems or the Linux, any kind of the command line interface, so you can um, do with this uh, terminal emulator. Okay. Or I series from IBM. So these are the add-ins that I explicitly installed while I do EFT. So then, on this add-in manager, whenever you are testing, say, SAP application, you have to make sure this SAP add-in should be checked. Generally, you can develop any scripts on SAP GUI. Otherwise, if you don't have SAP add-in, then you are trying to record, or you are trying to create some script on SAP GUI. So it ended up with no scripting. Basically, the UFT says um, it couldn't recognize those objects on the application. Okay, so that's the importance of the add-in is um, in order to recognize the object on the application. Add-ins are required to recognize 
the object under application uh, to recognize the application under test. Okay, so once you make sure, let's say, because most of the time you're going to test the web application, so you have to make sure this web admin should be checked. Okay, so any questions on this add-in manager? It is clear. What is the importance of add-in and why we need add-in in UFT? Any questions? No, basically, like you see, uh, Activex and the uh, web, Activex is basically a third party controls. Like the Activex <laughs> controls are, so if you look at uh, any kind of applications, say, I think if, if you, you are familiar with this application, so if you log in, So activates are the third party controls that gets embedded in any application, like whether it's a web application or a desktop application. Um, okay, so here you have this, uh, this is basically called an activates control, like where it has more than one standard control. So this is just you see, this is a, a simple text box, right? Whereas if you look at here, there are three text boxes that are combined together for the date control. So these are the activate controls that are embedded in applications. So that's where you always make, make sure the activates check whether you test uh, web or digital basic or Java or any other application. Okay? Just to make sure that you know, if you don't get into any issues. And if application has a of flex, is there any adding? Like here, yeah, we have this uh, flex adding. That, that, that's basically if you test this uh, kind of uh, flash applications, those things. Yes, so they have that uh, adding in here. Uh, suppose if you choose the general element here, do we need to have the knowledge of the scripting? No. So, it is scripting and those things part of your testing. But here you are developing the script. All you have to do is just follow the test scenario and then develop the script. Okay? So you have nothing to do your Unix script. All you have to do is familiar with this uh, as automation tester. You should be familiar with key, your key and the VB scripting part, not the Unix scripting part. Uh, how many browsers are supported? Uh, those are basically, uh, even if you look at uh, hp.com, they provide the release notes. And uh, mostly like they're going to support uh, the industry standard browsers like uh, Chrome, Firefox, and Internet Explorer. Uh, what I heard uh, recently is because uh, very recently, I think the last week they released the UFT 12. Um, it seems like they provide the support for the other browsers like uh, Safari or whatever. I'm not sure. I have to look at the release notes that comes with UFT 12. Okay. But, uh, but uh, to my knowledge, uh, if I remember correctly, UFT 11.5 has support for Chrome, Firefox, and Internet Explorer. Okay, so even if you want to know further, um, basically you can go to the website and then uh, they're going to talk about uh, what are the supported environments. So they released, uh, so if you look at say UFT12, that's the latest, the very latest version 
that came into this market. I think the last week they released this one. So, so this is uh, the UT12 version, very latest one. And just you can go through some of its videos, like what are the announcements they did. Uh, then, uh, best collect, they also provide some release notes. And here, so here uh, you have this uh, demo some products and then something they might provide. Yeah, just go to this uh, uh, somewhere like you see the release notes, and they 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 tell like what are the what are the support in the environment like uh, operating systems, and also the browsers. Okay, that's the UFT twelve. They extended the browser support. Mm, they are saying what is new, but uh, they didn't provide any weather being. Okay, so they're talking about all these features here, like what this uh, EFT 12 will support. Um, just you can go to this one. So they might have mentioned somewhere about uh, the support of environments. Okay. Then what's the next question? Uh, Uh, whenever I try to open flight uh, application after login, it says invalid attributed object and it fails. Hmm, I'm not sure what that uh, is. Uh, probably I have to look at your system. Okay, well, I can do that uh, in the next class. Yeah, this are only identifying the objects, nothing to do with the scripting language. Add-ins are basically the internal product TTP, the UFT, right? It's basically the like, uh, yeah, for the object identification mechanism. Okay. Nothing to do with the scripting means, so basically it's going to develop the script that way. If you have, say, something, um, if you select here, Java add-in, right? And then whenever you create the scripts, taking the Java application, all you see is when you record the script uh, or when you create the scripts for against uh, the normal window application, right? The normal desktop application. Uh, so you're going to see 
something the say window login and then uh, dot uh, say window button win button and then say okay dot click so this is the kind of scripting you will get but whereas when you when you select this java add-in and you are trying to create the script checking as a Java application. So instead, it says window, then it's going to say the scripting Java window. And also, it says Java button. Okay, so that's the difference that what you see uh, with the required add-ins. That's how the scripting will be done up using the UFT. Okay. So that's, that's, that's the difference that you can see. Uh, with the required add-ins that are installed. How to get uh, continue with this year evolution version license? Okay, uh, you can continue. Basically, you can install the VMware. <laughs> so VMware is like what you're creating a one uh, a virtual machine on your system, and then you can continuously use your team. It's not a it's not a big deal. Okay, you can install VMware, you can create a virtual machine, and whenever it expires, you just uh, remove that virtual machine and then create a new one and install your thing. H2K emphasis provides world-class online IT training, staffing, and software testing solutions to customers worldwide. H2K Infosys, how we are different from our competitors. 100% job-oriented training, hands-on project work, cloud test lab, resume preparation and review, mock interviews, robust syllabus, one-time fee and lifetime access to classes, access to recorded sessions of live classes. H2K Infosys has won the trust of thousands of students worldwide. For a free demo class, visit us at h2kinfosys.com.